Chapter 4 An hour before dawn, a long, timber-loaded train that smelled sweetly of pine resin stopped them at a country crossing. Colonel Meacham got out of the car and stood watching the train, silently reciting the names of the railroad lines tattooed on the sides of the freight cars. Trains released strange lyrics in Colonel Meacham, and though he could not articulate what he felt as he watched the great trains roll in passage along warm silver rails, his children knew that whatever poetry might lurk in their large, often unreadable father, it surfaced whenever he heard a train whistle. The destiny of his family in Chicago was wedded to the movement of trains through the Midwest. If the potato was symbolic of the Meacham family's flight from Ireland, then the freight train was the lucky talisman of their redemption in the New World. The children stirred slowly out of their sleep. Lillian groaned into a weakness with a loud feline stretch. Bull walked back to the open door and said, Pit stop, head run, get the dog out and let him lift his leg, everybody out who needs to pee. Sugar, Lillian said, I know this is an outrageous request, but the girls and I feel more comfortable powdering our noses and doing our business in a clean, well-lighted bathroom. It's good for you to get a little night air. Come on, Mary and Karen, you too. Go over there behind the trees. <clears throat> Don't you dare make a move, young ladies. We will keep our dignity. Okay, then. Let's get mad away. You too, Ben. Here, okra, I th- I want you to pee on the track while the train's moving there. It's not funny, Dad. That's why Okra hates your guts, Karen retorted. I don't need to go, Matt said, only half awake, and pulling his pillow tightly over his head to cut out the noise of the train. You better go now, son. You know your father didn't stop often. He only stops for three reasons. Trains, the death of someone in the car, or if he has to go to the bathroom, Ben said, climbing out of the car over Matt. As Ben walked toward his father, he was surprised to look up and see the universe shivering with starlight. Cotton grew in the field that bounded the railroad tracks, and the air was laden with the opulent smells of greening crops and leafy forests. Approaching the sea, the land had begun to slope gently. The hills were brushed downward, the earth was smoothing itself, and the river straightened for the final run to the sea. Ben and the colonel were urinating in the ditch that paralleled the highway. Bull commented on each car that flickered past like a single frame on a long roll of film. His voice was excited. As always, Bull felt euphoric and princely in the company of trains. There's the Illinois Central, the Southern Pacific, and right there goes the queen of them all, the Rock Island Line. That's one that half your Chicago relatives work on, Ben. Watch where you're whizzing, you almost hit my foot. Aim high and away. That's... The southern, there's a southern, probably carrying a box full of grits to some southern pansy living in New York. And then, in the regionless drawl of a conductor, the half-intelligent patois, belonging to no country that Bull had learned by imitation as a child, riding free on the Rock Island line, he began to chant, Davenport, Iowa, next stop, D- Iowa City, yes, Iowa, Iowa, Iowa City. Des Moines, Des Moines, Des Moines, Iowa, all off for Davenport. The voice of the conductor resided with great constancy, just below the customary pose of the fighter pilot. All aboard, he said, climbing back into the car as the caboose flashed by, and the thunder of the train diminished gradually, diminished gradually into the darkness. Bull barked out at Ben as the car moved across the tracks in first gear. Did Okra whiz? I think so, Dad, Ben answered. You're not paid to think, mister. I asked you a question. Yes, sir, he did, Ben said. You better be right. That was the last stop before Ravenel. Ravenel, Ravenel. Next stop, Ravenel, South Carolina. At dawn, and according to the strict schedule Colonel Meacham had plotted in Atlanta, they had come within 65 miles of the Marine Corps air station at Ravenel. The sun filled the car, and the children sleeping in the back began to stir heavily against the new day. Colonel Meacham reached for his aviator's sunglasses, which rested among the other paraphernalia of the journey on the dashboard. Best sunglasses in the world, he told his wife, civilian shades can't touch them. Isn't it a shame military doctors couldn't be as good as military sunglasses, Lillian said. Hey, not bad, sports fans. That was a good line. Bull, there's nothing in this road, not even a pig. Are you sure we're going the right way? Of 
affirmative. The navigator has never made a mistake in his career. Oh, I don't know about that. I seem to remember a night when the navigator took a wrong turn and we ended up in eastern Tennessee instead of western North Carolina. Uh, the grits who put up road signs in the south, road signs in the south, never got past second grade. Just to change the subject, Sugar, you haven't told me the gossip on the old squadron. Where are all the Cobras now? What are they doing? Sam Pancos and Ali Oliver are stationed in Ravenel. Rocky Green's in El Toro. His wife left him six months ago to run away with a 22-year-old corporal and his squadron. Rocky's got the kids. Poor kids. The conversation centered around the Marine Corps. Moving from one old friend to another, men and women they had been stationed with whose destinies had crossed again and again. The fraternity of marine fighter pilots was small, intimate, and exceedingly close. The year's absence from the military had put Lillian somewhat behind in following the lives of some of her friends. Transfers were constant among all of them, and with both Lillian and Bull, it was a peremptory requirement of their no nomadism that they keep a vigilant eye on the travels of their peers. <clears throat> the two of them talked very little of politics, literature, or the arts. Most of their conversation was of the core or of their own family. Ben shifted uncomfortably on the other side of the car. The sun was pouring in the car directly on his face. He heard his father say that they had been out of Georgia for a half hour, out of Georgia, Ben thought, in a South Carolina. Georgia born, Ben fell a strong kinship to the blood red earth. His father hated, loved the fragrant land he saw mostly in night passages, whose air was filled with country music and the virile smells of crops and farm machinery, possessing the miles between towns. It was the one place he could hold to, fix upon, identify as belonging to him. He was rooted in Georgia because of the seal on his birth certificate. He lived there only when his father went overseas, but that made no difference to him. No matter how hard he tried, he never developed any imperishable allegiances to the washed-out, bloodless marine bases where he had lived for most of his 17 years. It was difficult to engender fealty for any geographical point, <clears throat> and he had dwelt in four apartments and six houses two trailers and one Kwanzaa hut and his forced enlistment in the family of a marine officer. Every house was a temporary watering place where warriors gathered for training and the perfection of their grim art before the tents were struck again. He longed for a sense of place, of belonging, and of permanence. He wanted to live in one house, grow old in one neighborhood, and wanted friends whose faces did not change yearly. He renewed his tenuous claim on Georgia with every visit to his grandmother's house and with each dash through the countryside following the necklace of marine bases <clears throat> strung through the swamplands of the Carolinas and Virginia. Rising on one elbow, Ben addressed a question to the front seat. When y'all think we'll get there? Y'all? Bull roared, y'all isn't a damn word. What's this y'all stuff? I go overseas for 12 months, and I come back to all my boys talking like grits. Y'all is perfect grammar, Ben darling. Lillian objected. It's perfect, and it's precise. Don't use that word when you're addressing me. You gotta realize, Lillian, that a southern accent sounds dumb anywhere outside of the Mason-Dixon grit line. I think it sounds cultivated. Anyway, you managed to make sure none of the children have a southern accent. It was true, none of Bull Meacham's children had accents. Their speech was not flavored with the cadences of the South, the slurred rhythms of the region where they had spent their entire lives. Every time one of his children made a sound that was recognizably Southern, Bull would expurgate that sound from his child's tongue on the spot. Though the Marine Corps put its bases in the South, he could never accustom him to the sad fact that he was inevitably raising southern children. He could exercise the language of the south, but he could not purify his children of the experience that tied them forever to the south, to the strange separateness, the private identity of the land which nourished and enriched their childhoods. Let's see what else has gone to pot since the big dad has been gone, Bull announced. What's the capital, Montana, Karen? 
I just woke up, Daddy, Karen protested. And ask you for a speech, I just asked a question. Bismarck, she answered after thinking for a moment. Wrong, you're supposed to know them all. Helena, Matt said. Right, Matt. Here's another one, Karen. This one, this will be a chance to redeem yourself. It's too early in the morning, Daddy. I don't feel like playing capitals. Too bad, he answered. What's the capital of Idaho? Just a minute, don't tell me. Let me think about that one. You ought to know it right off the bat, girlsy, he said. Boise, she screamed. Yeah, but I gave you a hint. Marianne Bull said, What's the capital of Uruguay? Uruguay. Montevideo. Ben, the capital of Afghanistan. Kabul. Good, good. I'll tell you kids something right now. You are lucky to be part of the, of a Marine Corps family. There are no kids in America as well trained in geography as you. You've been to more places than civilian kids even know about. Travel is the best education in the world. Sugar, Lillian Kud, the reason the children know all those capitals is because you threatened to kill them if they didn't learn them. It's called motivation, Lillian, Bull answered, grinning. Ben sat back against his pillow, thinking about what his father had just said. Then he said, We sure have lived in some of the great cities of the world, Dad. Triangle, Virginia. Jacksonville, Havelock, and New Bern, North Carolina. Meridian, Pensacola, and now Ravenel, South Carolina. Can't get much luckier than that. I met some Air Force brats in Atlanta. Now they do some good traveling. They lived in London, Hamburg, Rome, all over Europe. They'd skied in the Alps. They'd seen the Leaning Tower of Pisa. One of the boys spoke three languages. All of them had been to operas and gone to symphonies. I wonder how the Ravenel Symphony measures up to the London Philharmonic, Marianne said. I can tell you all you need to know about Europa, Bull said. I just spent a whole year inspecting the continent. Did you go to the Louvre, Daddy? Marianne asked. Sure, I went in and check out the Mona Lisa. You can stand anywhere in the room where that picture is, and the Mona Lisa's eyes will follow you. Leonardo da Vinci did a commendable job with that portrait. You really think so, Dad? Ben said, winking at Marianne. The old dad soaked up <clears throat> quite a bit of culture while he was sporting around the capitals of Europe. You're just too modest to flaunt it, aren't you, dear? Lillian said softly. That's right, modesty is one of my worst faults, Bull shouted, laughing, enjoying himself in the last 50 miles of his journey. Hey, Dad, Matt said, why doesn't the Marine Corps send its families overseas sometimes? <clears throat> They're probably afraid that Marine kids would whip up on Air Force kids. Could you imagine <clears throat> living in gay Paris, seeking French like natives? Ben wondered aloud. I can say hello, goodbye, and kiss my fanny in eight languages, Bull boasted. Why, well, Bull, Lillian said, I didn't know you were multilingual. I pick up languages real fast, she replied, missing the irony in her voice. If you'd only work a little harder on your native tongue, she said. Very funny. Marianne spoke out brightly, extravagant, extravagantly. Let's talk some more about how lucky we are to be military brats. <clears throat> I'm so lucky that I get to go to four high schools instead of just one, Ben declared with feigned enthusiasm. And I, the lovely Marianne Meacham, whose beauty is celebrated in song and legend, Marianne began. Boy, that's a laugh, Matt said. Quiet midget before I feed you to a spider. Um, Matt called. We just have a little ways to go, children, so try to get along. Or else I'm going to have to butt a few heads, the colonel glowered through his sunglasses. Anyway, Marianne continued. I'm lucky enough to be absolutely friendless through an entire school year until the month of May. Then I make lots of new friends. Then I'm lucky enough to have Daddy come home with a new set of orders. Then I'm lucky enough to move in the summer and lucky enough to be absolutely friendless when school starts back in the fall. I know you're kidding, Lillian said to Marianne, and I know all of you are upset about leaving Atlanta. Tough toenails, Bull growled. But these are some wonderful part but there, these are some wonderful parts about growing up in a marine family. You learn how to meet people, learn how to go up to people and make their acquaintance. 
You know how to act in public. You have excellent manners, and it's easy for you to be charming. I've had many compliments about how polite my children are. This is the benefit of growing up in the military and the gift you take with you no matter where you live. You know how to act. But the main thing, Hogs, Bull said, you had to hang around me and all my good qualities will rub off on you. His family groaned in chorus and the colonel threw back his head and bellowed with laughter. Can't wait to get out of this car, Karen said, after a silent five-mile stretch. Matthew added, I've got to go number one. My teeth are floating. You should have gone when we stopped for the train, Bull said. I didn't have to go then, Matthew replied. The car was silent as the Meacham family moved across the bridge that crossed the Combahassee River toward their fourth home in four years. All hills had died in this last slant toward the sea. Stands of palmettos and live oaks met the car as the road ribboned out straight in its last sprint to the barrier islands. But the most remarkable feature of the land was the green stretches of march, green stretches of marsh fringing the rivers and inlets that spilled and intersected through the whole landscape. These were vast, airy marshes, some of them 30 miles wide, as splendid as fields of ripened wheat, yet as desolate in some ways as the dark side of the moon. Every eye in the car filled up with marsh, moved by it, stirred yet uncomprehending. It was an alien geography that thrushed outreaching, Along the water's edge, a land of a thousand creeks, brown and turgid, but rich in the smell of the sea. Lillian knew about marshes from girlhood summers spent on the Georgia coast. The Chevrolet crossed a bridge that announced the entry into Ravenel County. Thirty more miles, Hogs. Tell us about the new house, Bull. I'm perishing from curiosity, Lillian spoke. It's a surprise, Bull gloated. I gotta go number one real bad, Matthew said. Tough Titty, Bull answered, his sunglasses eyelessly hunting for Matthew in the rearview mirror. <clears throat> we should have gone when we stopped for the train. Cross your legs, darling, Lillian advised and offered up for a good intention. Like the conversion of Russia, Ben suggested. suggested. The air had a fetid, fetid, tropical feel to it as it passed through the car. The land was flat, lush, and brilliantly green. On the road's grassy fringes, black men and women, sometimes alone but often in lethargic twos or silhouetted in triplicate, walked the long stretches between shacks and cabins where plumes of morning smoke trailed above rusty tin roofs and smells of breakfast spilled from open windows and entered the rush of air that caromed about the Meacham car. Bacon, Lillian moaned as the car passed one small house. I'd rather eat bacon than a filet mignon. Bull grunted, a monosyllable meaningless in any language, but an audible assent that he had heard and understood her. He was tiring now, and his participation in conversation would diminish with each mile past. The children were staring at the windows. As strangers, they entered Ravenel with sharpened, critical eyes, assimilating... (coughs) Every image that passed by them, so that what they saw was the addendum of ten million impressions that registered briefly and almost tangentially in their minds, like flags of undiscovered countries. Each image a single frame of memory, whose lifespan was light quick and heartbeat fast. Each a mystery, clamoring for preservation for life, for admittance to the vaults of the brain, where remembrance burns. Each child in the car hunted for the familiar, the sights that would relate Ravenel to the other towns that had served as temporary homes. A jet passed overhead. The sound poured into the car like a liquid. Leaning his head out the window, Bull scanned the tree line for a glimpse of the plane. That's the sound of freedom, he said. It was a sound familiar to all of them, its thunder rumbling across them as though they were long sheets of glass. It was a legitimate sound of home, one that would remind the Meacham children of their youth more strongly than the singing bells of ice cream trucks or the cadences of lullabies. Moments later, Marianne began to cry. It was soundless weeping, free from hysterics, unrelated even to grief. Her eyes glistened as the tears rolled down her face and clearly defined salt creeks. What's the boo-hooing about? Colonel Meacham stormed at 
His rearview mirror, catching and holding the image of his weeping daughter. You better get her to stop, Lil. I can't stand boohooing. Get a Kleenex to wipe your face, Marianne. There's nothing to cry about. You gotta give it a chance. I gave it a chance, Marianne replied miserably. I hate this town, too. You learn to love it. Give it time. If I were you, I'd say, I'm gonna take this town by storm. I'm gonna go out of my way to meet people, and I'm gonna be the most popular young lady in Ravenel by the time I leave here. Spirit, I take. She got to turn off the waterworks, Lillian. We don't need a speech. I'm trying, Bill. Just give me a chance. Marianne is just upset about moving. So are all the kids. Tell the hogs too bad from the big dad. I don't care if they're upset or not. Marianne searched her purse for a Kleenex, but pulled out instead a teaspoon pirated from her mother's silver service. Crying gently, she held the spoon under her eyes, carefully catching each tear. Preserving their sad silver in the hollow of the spoon. I'm real depressed, she said finally. I'm going to hate this town. I wish I were dead. Bull replied, you may get your wish if you don't cut the weep scene, the weepy scene. When the tears filled the spoon to overflowing, when the edge of the spoon brimmed with the trembling residue of her grief, Marianne carefully flicked her wrist and the warm liquid flew the length of the car, only slightly dispersed and splashed against Bull's head. I ain't believing somebody spit on me. Bull bellowed in disbelief, his hands filling his hair. Has someone gone nuts? Excuse me, Daddy dear, the spoon slipped, Marianne protested innocently. Three more tears lit into the spoon. Aiming carefully, Marianne flicked them on her father's neck. <clears throat> Lillian broke in. Remember, darling, what I told you? If you have lem- a lemon, make lemonade. You have to give a town a chance to grow on you. You have to open yourself up to a town. Be willing to take chances. You've been in the core long enough to know that. I am not in the core, Marianne said to her mother, tossing another sunbright tear at her father's head. It missed, passing over his right ear and splashing down on his arm, where it lay trapped on the dense red hairs of his arm. I ain't believing she's bombing me with tears, Lillian. You can't stop her, Bull said. You want me to stop her? Stop hitting your father this very instant, young lady, Lillian flared. But there is not much menace behind Lillian's attempts at discipline. The next tear hit Matthew on the forehead. Weirdo just hit me with a tear, Mama. I'm going to mix those tears with a little blood if she isn't careful, Bull said. I said stop, Marianne, and I mean it. Remember who you are. I'm a weirdo, Marianne answered. You are a lady, Lillian said imperiously. And ladies don't catch their tears in spoons and hurl them at their families. A lady grieves in silence. She always has a smile on the outside. She waits until she is alone to express her sorrow. I like to do it in full public view. I'd like to draw huge crowds of people and weep all day. I'd flick tears at the crowd until each one of them was hit with a tear. I like people to share in my misery. I like them to feel it when I feel bad. Gosh, I feel miserable. Don't take the Lord's name in vain, Lillian admonished her daughter. Ladies... I know, Mama. Ladies don't speak with vulgar tongues. How do ladies talk? I'd really like to know. A lady just knows how to talk. It's not something she's taught. It is something within her, something inherently gentle and refined. She says nothing that offends or upsets. A lady speaks softly, kindly, and the world spreads out before her and fights to do her favors. If a woman is not a lady at birth, no amount of money or education can make her one. A lady just is. <clears throat> Marianne saying with false joy, What a perfect description of me. Yes, that's how a dictionary would define me. Boy, what a joke that is, huh, Ma? Matthew said. Was that a voice? Marianne answered, cupping her hand to her ear. I thought I heard a tiny voice coming from a little insect body. It sounded almost human. Cut that out, Marianne. Quit teasing, Matthew. Yeah, because you're going to die real young if you tease me one more time, freckles. Matthew huffed. Marianne retorted, the only way you could kill me, little one, would be to enter my bloodstream. Let's cut it out, Ben said firmly. Ah, Marianne mocked, the voice of sublime perfection. Was that the godly one, the sainted brother, the perfect son? Before Ben could answer, both thundered out at all of them. I'm going to give you hogs about five seconds to cut the app, and then I'm going to pull this car over to the side of the road 
and I bet I can shut your yaps even if your mother can't. Hush, Lillian hissed at her children, not another sound. Her eyes cast a stern, desperate communique to her children, but this time there was no need. Both tone had registered. Each child knew the exact danger signals in the meteorology of their father's temperament. They were adroit weathermen who charted the clouds, winds, and high-pressure areas of his fiercely wavering moods with skill created through long experience. His temper was quick-fused and uncontrollable, and once he passed a certain point, not even Lillian could calm him. He was tired now, after driving through half the night. Behind his sunglasses, the veined eyes were thin with fatigue, and the most dangerous ice had formed over them. The threshing winds of his temper buffeted the car, and deep, resonant warning signals were sent out among the children. Silence ruled them in an instant. They resumed watching the diminishing countryside on the outskirts of Ravenel. Control, Lillian said soothingly. Control is very important for all of us. She was looking at her husband.